you're welcome to the IAEA for this presentation from Dr. Alpi Kinnick, uh, the chair of the Single Resolution Board. Um, she is here with colleagues, including Danny Fabrics. Over here? Her, her, colleague, her, her colleague on the board, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that they will both answer questions at the end of the, the, the presentation. The SRB are Europe's uh, banking firefighters. If you don't want ever to meet them, uh, you hope that they're there and ready at all times. Uh, but in the event that you do meet them, you want them to be uh, swiftly available and on your side. But they're not just firefighters, they also set uh, the requirements for fire proofing and for fire planning. Their, their real job, if you like, is to try to uh, ensure that all the buildings are ready for the fire. Uh, and differently look to a firefighter in the event of a fire, if your bank is on fire, they don't immediately set about rescuing it. They decide first whether it needs to be rescued. So this is quite a different uh, feature of the work. Um, Dr. Bennett is a professional accountant who came to her current role, first of all through uh, the accountancy industry, then through the insurance industry. She was then on the International Accounting Standards Board, and then became the president of the German banking regulator and supervisor of uh, I think uh, it was she who was brought in to put an end to light touch regulation. Um, in 2012, uh, but as the banking union became a key priority for Europe, uh, it was inevitable, I suppose, that Dr. Gunnick would be asked to engage with that process, and she was brought on board as the ch uh, chief executive, or as well as the chair of the single resolution board in 2015, I believe. And since then, she, has, she and her colleagues have done an excellent job of meeting what is, in fact, an impossible mandate be ready on day one for a fire that might happen on day two. Thankfully there have not been too many fires and those that have, have passed relatively peacefully. So perhaps I'll allow you to... I think I'll move over It's making it a bit easier. At least then I see also from my side the right wing. <laughs> Let me perhaps build... <coughs> Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to Ireland. I think I've got basically the idea that I should go to each and every member state once per year. At the same time, I thought I should go take only one country per month, and then you know the answer on that equation. But uh, let me jump on something you said, and Kevin, you know the SRB very well, because you were responsible for the first performance audit of this organization and you were very fair with an organization that was still in setup. I was used to the concept, you first set up, then you do a performance audit. We did it in parallel, so we used some of your comments actually to set it up. But uh, you said just firefighters, you don't want to ever meet them. And then I thought, yes, but when I look at some houses, it's very good to meet the firefighter sometimes, just to talk to them about what you need to improve in your house to make it fireproof. So you mentioned that afterwards, so at that point I think you like to meet the firefighter too. But with that let me try to uh, give you a bit an overview where we are. I think it's fair to say for Ireland, like for, for many other countries, that we have a good reason now to look backwards because it's one decade since the collapse of Lehman Brothers in the US or it's what, 10 years after the financial crisis severely hit a number of member states. For some it came by far later because they thought in the beginning it's the crisis of someone else. But countries like Ireland that were badly hit by the crisis, but that also made a very strong and a very fast recovery. So I think Ireland is, to that extent, for me, the example that shows that fast and decisive reaction to a problem helps to overcome it. Denial or snail space approaches don't solve a problem, they make them just a bit more expensive over time. So let me try to 
give you a bit of an overview of what are the lessons taken, what are some of them, not to the causes of the crisis, but what did the crisis reveal, and then giving you a bit of an answer to where do we stand today and what are the topics that are still on the agenda. Well, if you cast your mind back, I think 10 years ago, everyone got the feeling the sun is not shining, liquidity is ample, light touch regulation is the way to go, any rule you abandon is a good rule. So then we saw with the crisis that this idea of light touch regulation just did hide some of the mistakes. And what I think was most importantly, what we also saw is something which I think it's adapted to Keynes to say markets can stand longer irrational than you can stay liquid. So what it basically it means is this global belief of an always rational market of an everlasting liquidity just faded away or faded was probably never reality. What did it mean in the result? It meant that governments took the very tough decision to bail out banks in lack of alternative. I don't think that any government did it rightly because they thought this is the greatest thing you ever do with taxpayers' money. It was just done because the alternative insolvency of banks was so untested that people did not want to go that route. So what did it mean in the result, at least in my country, but I think the same here, was that everyone agreed at the end, never ever should bailout be the answer. We need to find a new, we need to find a system that works because otherwise it is basically turning market economy upside down, meaning that profits are private and when it comes to risk and losses, they are public for the taxpayer. So what did we do or what was then the result? In international terms, it was the Financial Stability Board. This was where Godwin and I met first when we were <coughs> discussing a resolution framework. And let's be fair, 10 years ago, resolution was only known as a New Year's resolution. And now, most people might be more disciplined than I am. My New Year's resolution only lasts till end of January, which is then my birthday, then I renew some of those ideas, and in February we get rational and we move on to what it was always. Now, resolution as a framework for bank is totally new, not just for Europe, but for everyone. Also, the FDIC, the Americans, did not have a resolution framework. They had a very functioning deposit insurance system in, within the FDIC, but not a real resolution framework. So the, F, the FSB worked on this, and the European Union was very forced to work on it too. It's called BRD in Europe, and then what we realized is we needed more for the, Europe, for the euro area because having one currency fits you even more together. So this is the banking union, creation of the banking union, single supervisory mechanism in place since end 2014, single res and active since end 2014, single resolution mechanism put in place in 2015, active since 1st of January 2016, and we are still waiting for the third pillar called the European Deposit Guarantee Scheme, where I think the wording in Brussels for the time being is, it will come, but for the moment it's on life support, or it's in coma, or some people say we need to push forward because we need the three pillars in the end. The first pillar, SSM, as SSM, very, uh, very simple, is the harmonized supervision under, in the, under the roof of the European Central Bank, direct supervision for the largest banks, indirect, so coordinating the level playing field for what is called the LSI, less significant institutions. Keep in mind, sometimes they can be very troublesome. The second pillar, single resolution mechanism, single resolution board, 
is the one I will now will talk a bit about. Civil resolution mechanism means that we work together, the national resolution authorities in the member states, so here, Central Bank of Ireland, together with the body in Brussels, and I'm always saying we need to work together because clearly in 19 different member states with a lot of non-harmonized law, you need to have a balance between national expertise and a harmonized European perspective. So what are we working on? And I think Kevin has already given a nice uh, example. We are actually a bit like firefighters. On the one hand, we are there to decide uh, to work. If a fire hits a building, we need to decide, is this fire hitting the building? So a building, <coughs> is the bank important enough to, to go to resolution, or should prevail what happens in any other economy. If you don't succeed in the market, well then, you don't succeed and you exit the market. And let's be fair, if we don't have banks exiting the market, this can also create more than just a small problem. So basically, the single resolution board is there to decide upon the need for a resolution, and if there's a need for the resolution, it's called a public interest assessment, then to deal with the resolution of this bank. Also, again, in coordination, but decided by the single resolution board, but in coordination with the national authorities that in from those countries where this bank is active. But our major work, and I think this is where we have, are really working on, because resolution is hopefully always the exception, is resolution planning. And again, as Kevin said, you can compare it easily to fire safety planning. What does it mean? We want to ensure that banks are resolvable. When we talk about banks being resolvable, the first decision you might have to take is to decide what, if this bank get, get, gets into trouble, what would be your expected answer? Is the bank so important, so interlinked, has critical functions, so that you will need an administrative procedure called resolution to solve this problem? Or is it a bank where you would say, well, it's one out of ten banks in this region, it's one out of there are, is an easy replacement, there is no interconnectedness, where you would then say, well, in that case, insolvency is the logical consequence if this bank gets into trouble. So, this is more the basic first question. The second then is, consider that we're now talking about the largest bank per member state, where you would always assume that they are so important that you prepare at least for resolution. The decision about resolution, yes or no, is always a point in time decision at the moment of failing of this bank. But for these banks, what does it actually mean, resolution, Pre uh, preparing for resolution? I would put it under two pillars. The one is we have learned through the crisis that resolution means that you need to find an answer how to get this business up and running again on Monday morning. For that, you need means, which means you need to be able to write down equity, you need to be able to write down uh, liabilities, convert liabilities into equities. All these are tools we have at hand. You can call them, and I'm just going for this two, one too, you can call it an open bank bail-in. And then, to be able to have a solvent bank opening on Monday morning. Now, this doesn't work without money, and the money is called, in international terms, TLEC, in European terms, MREL. We are working on that. We took the first binding decisions on MREL for the largest groups last year. We are now, this year, taking binding MREL decisions for all, nearly all the banks under our remit, there's always an exception to rules, and we are refining those decisions for the largest banks, and those are the banks that are active in a number of member states, even outside 
the banking union, where we are now already in the second wave. Dominic has always said, it's a journey, I would say, to be precise, it's a marathon. It's not just a nice journey till next week. But we are working on step by step, improving MRAL, improving the quality with that quality of capital, which means talking this year about subordination, talking about location of MRAL. It's a long topic. But MRAL is needed, it's indispensable, but it's not the entire answer because the second part of the answer is, well, is the bank really resolvable from an operational point of view? It starts with, do you have the needed data? It's easy to say we will bail in creditors and then you scratch your head and say, but who is it? Do you know the numbers? Do you know who is this? So it's data availability, liabilities, but not just liabilities, and you need to have them available on the spot. I think we all know. I knew it from my times as a CFO. There's never a good time to start a giant ICT project. It's always too expensive. So this is needed, no doubt. The second part is not just financial, uh, not just data. It's also really to define what are the critical functions you must preserve or not. Can you separate? I think some of us have an interesting memory of have memories which we don't want to repeat in saying how do you separate from a very complex organization over the weekend. So this, how do you? Define that you have access, ongoing access to critical to market infrastructure and the like. So it's a, quite a number of topics. On top comes for some banks. What is your legal form? Think about a cooperative bank. If you pay in creditors, are you changing the legal form? Is it? How can you do it? So we have a lot of topics we are dealing with under resolution planning. But I think the most important one is actually, as we are always saying that, we are not the project managers inside the bank. Our teams, and we have our team that's covering the Irish banks here, is not the one that tells the bank, and now you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then it's all done. We are addressing a topic, and we are then listening to the bank, and it's for the banks to come up with a solution, we are monitoring it, we are pushing them, and to take a wording, we hope also to be able that with this kind of adult talk, we can avoid to do decision, not avoid because we are afraid of, but avoid because it's a very complex and cumbersome process, to do formal decisions on the removal of obstacles to resolution because this would be a formal administrative act then the bank gets time then we get time ideally hope i think it works normally to say we address the topic and banks understand they have to deal with it if they don't do we have the tools at hand to go into a formal decision well it's a bit like i tell you I tell you do it normally, you tell it two times and then you get a bit more serious. So we can write letters, but this is, we write letters, but we don't want to do administrative procedures. So this is what we're working on. It will take us well into 2020, I would expect, to get this done. There's <coughs> also one thing to be considered. When I go to the European Parliament, the first question I will get, you can bet on it, is how many decisions have you taken on removal of impediments? So far none, because we are talking to the banks. And have all bank, are all banks resolvable today? And I would say they are better resolvable than they were a year ago. But it will take us till 2020 to really have elaborate resolution plans for all banks. And there is one more topic. Most of the biggest of the big banks have got so-called resolution colleges where we work together with the non-Eurozone members. Now being in Ireland, you are fully aware of colleges because your banks have a footprint in the UK or the other way around. So that case we have to consult the non-Eurozone members of the EU 
on our resolution plan. They have four months' time to respond. We have to agree on the resolution plan, all making perfect sense, but making it fairly complicated to get a process that takes you roughly 18 months into one year's time frame. So that basically, I think, we will move really naturally, because it doesn't work otherwise, to a not an annual process, but a process that takes a bit longer. But the basic framework within the regulation is still one resolution plan per year, so iterations of the plan. It will take a bit longer, but I think for that hopefully be sounder. So where do we stand beside that? At the same time that we are introducing the current legislation, the legislator is working on a revision of the current legislation. So we have the project called BRID2, I think the French call it the November package still, or it's called the risk reduction package. When you hear all of this, you always need to ask people which part of the piece puzzle they are talking about. It's, for us, it's the revision of some of the, uh, of the parts of the BRID and the SRMR. In particular, it's changes to the ERA requirements strengthening them, introducing a pillar one to a pillar two, and the like. Clearly, we would hope for this work to come to an end as soon as possible. It looks like a political compromise has been reached last week in the trilogue. So that's good news, but it will actually then mean that we have to also introduce it, which is part of the reasons why we have, are moving in steps we want to fully address the current legislation, but also not move in the wrong direction compared to what might come in the new regulation. But at the same time, I'm always telling, if member states talk about changing something, well, as long as there is a sign that says I'm not allowed to drive more than 50 kilometers per hour in town, I have to adhere to that sign even if someone talks about 70. So it's not it. The second part is something we are pushing for because we saw that in recent cases. Please always keep in mind corporate law, tax law anyhow, but also insolvency law is not regulated in Europe. So when we talk about resolution, which is a European regulation and a European framework, then we have always to compare our decisions to the outcome of a national insolvency procedure. And there, for the banking union, we have 19 plus, because some member states offer options in this field, so that we don't have the same, well, outcome per member state. And we are clearly saying it doesn't only make our life easier, it makes also the life of our Irish colleagues here easier, because so far we are talking, we need national handbooks to trans late a decision in Brussels into national decision, partially because we have, well, we have different laws. So this is something we are pushing for. I'm not seeing any movement there before the next parliament to come. And last but not least, we are setting up our, I already touched on the European Deposit Guarantee System, that will take longer. But we are actually also setting up our uh, single resolution fund, financed like the entire operation by the industry. And we are in discussion to hopefully finalize the debate, at least the political debate around the backstop, who provides the backstop, under which conditionality, backstop meaning the credit line behind our fund so that in case of need, but I would say it's the last resort to a last resort, we have the can draw on me to fund a resolution, which then the means have to be repaid by the industry. The second part is far away still, is liquidity in resolution, because even on Monday morning you have now a solvent bank, you have a viable bank hopefully, I hope we have done a good job over the weekend, but there might not be a long queue in front to put money into the bank, but rather a queue that still thinks, let's think twice. So liquidity bridging <coughs> from resolution into normal operation and liquidity is still a topic. So, and with that, just two words that I really keep 
very quiet there. Normally on the famous B word, I think banking was the most challenged to Ireland 10 years ago. Was that the B word probably? And now the B word is Brexit. Now we all saw that yesterday the member states agreed on the exit. Was it an agreement? And now we have to see what our British friends are doing. I think no reason to be very excited about the entire debate. But from the SRB's point of view, we have started already early this year to address basically only two topics. You could boil it down to say business as usual if and when the UK becomes a third country or then the rules for third country supply. But what does it actually mean for those banks in the EU that have over decades funded themselves by issuing bonds using English law, they have to realize that with the exit of the UK in principle or remaining on how they finally word rules, these issues will become issues by under the law of a third country, meaning that they are in principle no longer annual eligible. Reason for that, that they then have no longer the statutory clause that makes a resolution decision immediately effective towards these bonds. So this is something we have warned. You can now separate and say, well, issues before the referendum while well, the banks didn't know that this was to come. Issues since the referendum, I hope the banks have started to introduce the needed contractual clauses. But in any case, we have stated publicly, we've stated to the banks, that on those banks that have issues under UK law, we will have an individual look. We might consider that it's something which is anyhow expiring in a year or two, so it's not a big deal. But what are you dealing with bonds that are perpetual bonds? Because introducing a clause afterwards is probably the only thing that's not really on the table. So it's more a warning to the banks within the banking union not to carry on as you always did. The second part is something where, in particular here, our Irish colleagues have been to the forefront and very active. Banks that now need a new home to passport their business within the banking, within the EU. And here, our answer has been very simple. We need to ensure that those banks, their operations in the EU stay resolvable, which means now, just to simplify it, if you consider that they will have to set up at some point an intermediate holding in the EU, then this business is fueled into London, then it's fueled into and into, which would give us a concern. So what we are talking about, like the banking and like the supervisors, is please no empty shells, no letter boxes, but operations where when you talk to the risk officer in the banking union, he knows what he's talking about, or to put it for a bit more, uh, more well, into a picture. I read an article by the uh, insolvency administrator of Lehman, Germany, and one of the explanations he gave was, well, for the, because they have just finished the insolvency procedures for Lehman, Germany, which was a limited company in Germany, and he said the first 18 months he spent on trying to figure out where the records of Lehman Germany were and to buy them back. Mm -hmm. Because with the failure of Lehman, part of it became Barclays, part of it became Nomura. Booking was within the group of Lehman some way, and I think from what I understood, and there were some outsourcing partners that still had open bills with Lehman and therefore thought they first paid and then they had over copies of records. So 
And I think we should be today in a position to say if we have a failure, we want to know where the records are, we want to know how to start and how to solve the problem and not to scratch our head. You should never repeat a mistake within 10 years. So that's the simple argument. Let me conclude here, as always when you talk to the police or you talk to the firefighters all the life, you get a bit depressed because life is very risky. But at the same time, I think we all need to acknowledge we have put in place over the last 10 years a lot of regulation. We have banks have imp improved their balance sheets, have addressed NPLs, not everywhere to the pace you would love them to do, but they have reduced it, they are doing it. So banks are in a better shape, but and we have now tools at hand to hopefully solve problems that 10 years ago we were a bit empty-handed. So no reason to be depressed, and in particular here, I would say to some reason, to take good lessons from what Ireland did. And as I started to say, if you address a problem, do it fast, do it forceful, it's easier. That's something for Europe as a whole. And don't believe that 10 years after, now it's all solved and we can go back into old habits. And with that, someone wrote me up how I should say goodbye. But for me, Irish is such a, or Gaelic is such a weird combination that the pronunciation in English doesn't make any sense either. So thank you for your patience.